Some of you have asked me today where my wife is, and uh, that is a $10 million question. She, uh, last Sunday, you know, I've been here three or four Sundays, and I've only made a couple, but last Sunday she was in uh, San Antonio, Texas, visiting the youngest grandson, uh, which I didn't get to go for. That was supposed to be really sad and have some awe moments. Oh, you know, thank you. Uh, but today, um, Leslie and I, it's kind of funny, y'all didn't even ask me if I was a member of the Missouri Baptist Church when you asked me to become, you know, your interim pastor or anything else. But I am, so just for you to know. Mine and Leslie's church membership is in Freshwater Church, Bolivar. And you might say, Bolivar, you live in Jefferson City. That's correct. Our, our home church is in Bolivar. And, uh, but the reason it's in Bolivar is because we are in a new church plant in Jefferson City that is a sister church or daughter church to Freshwater Bolivar called Freshwater Jeff City. And so our church membership had to be in Freshwater Bolivar to be part of Freshwater Jeff City. Now that you're totally confused, um, uh, I, get to, I get to serve as an elder of Freshwater Jeff City or a, a lead on the leadership team at there in Jeff City. And uh, uh, this morning, we've been meeting since September the 5th last year in Holmes. In January last year, we started meeting in a Lutheran high school there in Jeff City. Yes, a Southern Baptist church meeting in a Lutheran high school. This Lutheran high school said, you know, the entire community helped us build our school building, our high school building. Yes, we want to help you build your Southern Baptist church. I thought that was just pretty rock and cool. Uh, you know, so, um, and then they're building a new gymnasium and an auditorium. They came to us and asked us how we wanted lights and sound done in the auditorium because they want us to continue to meet in their school building. And I thought, yeah, they just really want our money. We took them, <laughs> we took them a check for $10,000 and handed it to them, and the school brought up that check back to us in an envelope torn into shreds and said, we don't want your money. We want to be here to help you. That's awesome. Anyhow, long story short, today, this morning, is the first real Sunday morning church service for Freshwater Jeff City. And so Leslie thought it would be pretty important to go to church there today. For some reason, um, I, I laughed and I was telling the rest of the leadership team, I don't know anybody that goes to church here anymore because I won't be there. We've been meeting on Wednesday nights. It's fantastic. Um, but that, that's all good. This past week has been a crazy week. Uh, I, I logged almost 1,700 miles on my vehicle this last week. Uh, from, from being here last Sunday to back here last Tuesday um, to the Boot Hill one day to Lebanon one day and uh, then all around there. It's just been a crazy wild week. Plus, during this week, um, I had a work team at the Disaster Relief Warehouse building erecting a brand new 80 by 80 building to put our uh, state kitchen in, our mobile command unit in, and several other things. So it's just been a, a crazy wild week uh, for that to happen. But God is so faithful and He is so good to take us to the places that He wants us to go and to give us the energy that He wants us to have to do the things that He's called us to do. Now I know many of us sitting around here this morning go, I am tired. I am exhausted. I need some rest. Yeah, you probably do, but you probably have more in you than you think you do if you would just get up and go. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you all are weak this morning. <laughs> weak this morning. You told us we were tired. Yeah, well, I was hoping for the little... Yesterday, my wife's doing this health food craze, you know, exercise. Any of y'all do that goofy stuff? Yeah, you're my kind of people. <laughs> so, so yesterday she was doing this stretch thing uh, on the floor, and I said, oh, I can do that. That's no problem. That, that's simple. Well, she took one leg and put it over the other leg, reached in the hole, and pulled her knee all the way back and touched her nose with it. Not a problem. I <laughs> I get down on the floor, I finally get this leg over this leg, and I, and I reach through, and I can't get to the front of my leg, so I grab the back, and I started yanking backwards, and something popped in my knee. And it sounded like a rifle going off. 
and my knee kind of hurts this morning, so if I fall down up here, don't think anything about it, I will get back up. So, in Matthew, Jesus knows his days are coming to a close. He senses that, that his earthly ministry is just about over. And it's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And so, so he gathers his disciples together and he tells them how to go make preparation for the feast, the supper that they're going to eat together. Now I want to stop right there this morning with you. Most of you know the story out of the book of Matthew when we're talking about the Lord's Supper. And, and we'll get to it, we'll read it in, in a few minutes. But I want, to, I want to talk to you about one very important aspect of this Lord's Supper. And that's preparation. Now for you today, you weren't quite like the disciples. You didn't have to go and, and, and find the man in the town, carry him to water, go follow him into the upper room, make the unleavened bread, get everything ready and set it all out. That was the preparation that the disciples had to do. This morning, the preparation for you is the preparation of your heart. Bringing your heart back together and making your heart where God wants it to be. It's the preparation that walks us up to where God wants us to be. To be able to take the Lord's Supper. Now, so often, we have gotten accustomed. And I say we because I had just got accustomed uh, from, from, my, from my pastoral work. That the first Sunday of every quarter in the Southern Baptist Church, you take the Lord's Supper no matter what. That's, that's the way you do it. It's just done that way. And some churches do it every Sunday. And some once a month. And it just, I mean, it just varies on how often someone takes the Lord's Supper. But for me, I stopped being prepared for the Lord's Supper. Not so much stop being prepared to preach a message for the Lord's Supper, but stop being prepared for what God wanted to do in my life as I came to the point of the bread and the cup in order to have Him work a mighty work in my life. So I got to thinking, okay, we need to make this something different. So in the church that I was pastoring, we stopped doing it the first Sunday of every quarter. You're talking about a business meeting that was crazy. That's one of the reasons I don't think we ever all have business meetings. Do I get an amen on that? <laughs> you are all right. But we stopped taking it the first Sunday of every quarter. And one of, the, one of the questions was, well, when are we going to do it? We need to know when we're going to do it. And I said, do you all trust me to be your pastor? Well, the overarching response was yes. I think a few of them probably didn't. But uh, the overarching response was yes. And I said, then let God tell me when it's time for us to take the Lord's Supper. And then at that point in my prayer life for, for our church, then God can start preparing us. So I would start announcing a month or so out that on this Sunday we were going to take the Lord's Supper. And then I would start preparing the people through messages that I would speak and through worship that we would sing, walking people down the path to be able to be ready to take the Lord's Supper because I never wanted it just to become a time for it to come by and you pick it up and you take a little cracker and you don't really even think much about what the Lord's Supper is. What the elements of the Lord's Supper even really mean. So in preparation for who God is in our life and for the things that He wants us to do, we must understand a few things. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. You can kind of start reading in verse 17, and, and I'm not going to read all of this, but you can just start reading in verse 17 and, and read down through about verse 30, 29 or 30. But what Jesus does in these verses is, is He prepares the disciples for what's getting ready to happen. And there's some pretty tough things, if you don't know the whole story, there's some pretty tough things that happen at the Last Supper, Jesus' Last Supper here on the earth. I mean, this is the point where one of his 12, one of his most inner trusted circle betrayed him, walked away, had already given him up. 
And it was called out, called on the carpet, called to make an account for what took place. Judas Iscariot had been skimming off the top. He was the treasurer of the disciples. And he'd been skimming off the top. And, and people understood, uh, Jesus understood who Jesus really, or who Judas really was, and the things that he had been doing. And so this didn't come to a surprise, as a surprise to Jesus. You know, there's some things that we think in the world today that it just really surprises God. You know, something bad happens and it was like, oh my gosh, did God know about that? I'm flying to Dallas, Texas on Wednesday. Do any of you know what Wednesday is? Yes. September the 11th. You know what I didn't realize Wednesday was when I made my flight? September, September the 11th. You want to know something? I'm not one bit scared to get on an airplane and fly September 11th. Because if something crazy was to happen again on September 11th like it did then, it's not taking God by surprise. And if I get to go to glory on September the 11th, hallelujah, I am in heaven. You all better rejoice. Don't cry. Don't be sad. I am playing golf with my daddy. And, and I'm walking beside the, the, walking on the, I preached one time that it was the golden streets of heaven, but I said the yellow brick road. Yeah. <laughs> That's the Wizard of Oz, Pastor. <laughs> but it wouldn't be a surprise to God if that was the day. It wouldn't be a surprise to God. And today, if, if salvation is for you today, at the end of this service, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's not a surprise to God. It's not like, oh, guess what? I didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah, he did. He knew it was going to happen. He planned it. He sent the Holy Spirit to you to convict you of the sin in your life. He knew what's taking place. It's all in His hand. It's all in His control. God doesn't, it doesn't surprise. So Judas's, Judas's life didn't surprise Jesus. And Jesus goes on and He prepares the disciples as they, as they are reclining around this table. He kind of tells them about what's going on. And he takes a piece of unleavened bread, bread without yeast, unrisen bread, and, and he tears it, and he says, this is my body. This is my body. This is a picture. This is a symbolization of my body. Now, it isn't his actual body. I've got to get that straight because there's some doctrine out there that this is the physical, actual body of Jesus Christ. It is not. It is a piece of bread I bought at Walmart. Okay? I wasn't smart enough to have the bakery make it up here for me. I bought it at Walmart. There's nothing fancy about this bread. There was nothing fancy about the bread that was on the table where Jesus was that day. It was unleavened bread. They were celebrating the feast of the unleavened bread. Okay, we got that. It's bread. But he takes it and he says, this is a picture of my body. Broken and bruised for you. Hence the idea of the torn or the broken bread. The bread that has been separated. Now he was telling the disciples this and they had no idea what was to come. See, they were still pretty much dumbstruck of, of what was going on. They still didn't realize to some degree how awesome and how important and how divine Jesus Christ was. Even though they had walked with Him for three years now, they still didn't have it all pulled together and couldn't figure it all out. And they were still having a hard time following the way that He talked. The way that He used His verbiage to, to get across to them all of the parables and all of the things that they did. Sometimes they just didn't understand. So as they were sitting there at the table, He was trying to prepare them. This is my body, broken and bruised, torn for you. And then he took the wine, and he said, and this wine is the picture or the semblance of my blood that is shed. Well, see, they didn't have any clue yet. Even though they had the Old Testament, they could go back and read that the Messiah would suffer great lengths for the church. They didn't pull it together. They didn't understand what all was going on. And he held the cup, and he said, this is my blood. Now, literally this morning, this is grape juice. Not even wine. Okay, so we're even we're getting even further away from that. I went to church with my daughter and son-in-law, Wendy and Craig. 
Craig was a youth pastor here one summer, so some of you remember him. They were going to church at Providence Church in uh, Frisco, Texas. Ashin Ziafad is the pastor there. I don't know if any of you know anything about Ashin. He's just an amazing uh, Iranian uh, Muslim converted Christian uh, that's just got a, a rocking testimony. It's just amazing. And I went there, and they were doing the Lord's Supper one day. And, and there were two goblets sitting up by the bread on each side. And Wendy said, Dad, just for you to know, the one on the right is wine. The one on the left is juice. Okay, no big deal. You know, I, it's, it's cool. I, I don't have a problem with that. And so all the way through this service, my mind was clicking. Scripture says wine. Scripture says wine. Scripture says wine. But I know that so many people really could have problems with alcohol. But So I, I made up my mind, Ryan, I made up my mind that when I went down front, I was going to the right. I was going to get my piece of bread and I was going to dip it in the right and I, and I was going to see if there was a difference. Guess what? There was absolutely no difference from the wine or the grape juice. Okay? I just, I'm teaching you here. I'm trying to prepare your heart. There's absolutely no difference. It's the fruit of the vine. Okay? No difference. Jesus told them, this wine, this is a picture of my blood that will be shed for you. We know today what that semblance is. Because just a few hours later, Jesus was hung on the cross. He was beaten and hung on the cross, died for us. We really see as, as, as Christians today, as modern Christians today, we really understand the Lord's Supper and the sacraments of the Lord's Supper so much better than the disciples did on that day. Because we have a whole picture and they had yet but a glimmer of what Jesus was talking about. Yet we take these days, these special times... And we just kind of, eh, and do it, and get up and walk out of church, and never think another thing about it. And you'll come in some Sunday, and usually the Lord's Supper table will be up here, and it would have it would have a tall stack of little cups of, of trays, and you and your first thought would be, oh, must be Lord's Supper Sunday, and you would just go on about your fellowship like you normally do. And at one point in the service, the deacons would come down front and they would pick it up and they would bring it to you and they would serve you and, and the pastor would say some pretty cool words and, and you would all take it and, and you you know and it would be over until the next Sunday that it was taken again. Let me ask you to be really honest this morning. How many of you fit that category? A lot of liars in here today. <laughs> Most of us fit that category. Most of us don't think anything else after we've taken it. And we might really think about it during the service, but, but afterwards we don't think anything else about it. Jesus showed us how to have communion with Him that is real and personal. And He had His disciples right there in Matthew. He had them, and, and He was sitting at the table with them. In verse 26 it says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, He broke it and gave it to His disciples. Take and eat. Then He took the cup, and He gave thanks, and He said, drink. He was participating. So not only, not only did, did He give them the provisions, and, and they had to prepare for what they had, they participated. They participated with Jesus. So there was preparation there was provision, and there's participation. And you have to see how all of this comes together to make the Lord's Supper something that is really, really an awesome time for us. Not a time for us as a worship service, but a time for us as we connect with the Creator of the world, as we connect with Jesus Christ on an intimate personal basis. He said, this is my body. This is a picture of who I am. This is a picture of what I have done for you. This is my blood. This is what I gave up on the cross.
for you, for the covering of your sin, for the total annihilation of sin in your life. This is real. This is real, and it's never to be looked at as just a portion of what we do as Christians. This is real. This is us connecting with Jesus. Let me ask you a question. How has He provided for you in your life? Even over the last month? Now, I don't want you to answer out loud. But I want you to just think about how Jesus, God, has provided for you over the last month. Now, I'm not talking about me. I'm just talking about your life. Every one of us. I mean, we're a very eclectic group in here. We have from young to old, everything in between. This is a great group of people. And God's got, each of us have different needs and different desires and different wants. And God is providing. He's providing for us as we walk through life. He was providing for His disciples an intimate time. His disciples did not realize that this would be the last time. Now in all of this, there was Judas, who I talked about earlier. Judas was probably never saved. This is one of those questions that, that's debated in seminary. Is Judas in heaven now? Who knows? And honestly, who cares? Because it doesn't make a bit of difference whether he's in heaven or not right now. Okay? It doesn't matter. What matters is on that day he was called out from an account for the sin that was in his life. This morning, in a little while, when we take this and you walk to the front of this church building and you stand over the bread, which is a picture of Christ's body, and you stand over the cup, which is a picture of the blood that was shed for you, he's calling you out. He's calling you out and He's asking you, what holds you back from full devotion? What's holding you from giving me 100% of your life? And let me just say, to be really honest, if there's something that's holding you back, if there's a stronghold that's keeping you from devotion to God, it's sin. There's a, there's, a, there's a blockade, there's a barrier, a sin barrier, and that sin can be multiple things. Then once again, we could do a whiteboard up here and we could list the blockades that's holding us from total devotion to God. And we could list stuff all day long. He's calling us to walk above it, to climb over that barrier. One night, four or five years ago, maybe longer than that, I got invited to come out to Fort Leonard Wood, and they were doing a night infiltration uh, for the basic training soldiers. And basically what it was was they took them out in the middle of the woods, they dumped them off, and they had barriers that they had to get over. And they had to crawl under barbed wire, and they got bullets shot over top of their heads and tracers. And they had to get from point A to point B in a certain amount of time. And they had to make all the obstacles. And there was all of these people out in the woods that would jump out and scream at them and scare them. And, and, and bombs going off all the way around them. But there were these barriers. And for them to complete the course, for them to be able to graduate from basic training, they had to make every one of those barriers. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been through that. They had to complete this course. And they couldn't go around the barriers. And so sometimes someone would get up over the barrier, but then they'd have to come back up over the barrier to help their friends get up and over the barrier. Their battle buddies get up and over the barrier because you cannot leave your battle buddy behind. can't leave them waiting. So when Jesus calls you today, He asks you, what's that barrier? Drop it. Just let it down. And allow God to fill your heart with something that is awesome and amazing. 
Go back and grasp the things that he has provided for you over the last month and put them into contrast with the things that you need to give up and allow God to do a mighty work in your life. He took this cup and he took this juice and he gave it to them. And then he said, this blood is a covenant which will be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Then verse 29 it says, And I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus was telling them there will be tomorrow. There is going to be a tomorrow. Now you say, well, duh, Dwayne, tomorrow's Monday. No, I'm talking about eternally. There is going to be a tomorrow. And we are going to be gathered tomorrow. And we're going to get to do this with Jesus tomorrow. There will be a day when we get to come together as the united bride of Christ. Unblemished. Wrinkle-free. Standing in the presence of God Almighty. Today is yet just a reflection of what that day will be. <coughs> this morning as we prepare to take this Lord's Supper, as we prepare to come to a point in this service where it's, uh, where it's really vitally important that, that we think about what God's doing, I just ask that you would, you don't have, we're not going to dismiss you by rows to come down. I'm just going to ask that you would have some prayer time in your seat. And when you're ready to come to the front to take this, come. Take a piece of bread, which is the picture of the body of Christ. Dip it in the glass of juice, which is the picture of the blood that was shed for us. Now, let me give couple really quick instructions. You don't have to be a member of the First Baptist Church of Salisbury to do this. But you have to be a Christian. You have to come to the point in your life where you have asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin and turn the Lordship of your life over to Him. Become a Christian. Become a believer. And today, if you cannot do that, if you can't say, Dwayne, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. Then I would ask that you just abstain from coming and taking the Lord's Supper. And then I would ask that after it's all over, you find me. And I would love to share faith with you. Michael would love to share faith with you. And we would love to stand here with you while you take the Lord's Supper. Today, it's yours. This is about your relationship with Jesus. It's about you interacting with God on a personal, intimate level today. We pray with you, please. Father, today, as we see that you have made provisions for us, Lord, you had plans, you have provided. And God, now we give our life to you. Father, we know that there's open wounds here today. God, we pray that, that through taking of this Lord's Supper in such an intimate way, that you can start to heal and scab over things that keep us from total surrender. Father, today, find us to be faithful in all that we do. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Anytime you so feel fit to come to the table, come and take a little supper.
Father God, as we have come, have taken, Lord, we ask now that you would just do a mighty work in us. Lord, as we have connected, you have heard our prayers. Lord, we have dropped multitudes of barriers and blockades. Lord, find us to be a people of commitment and devotion to you. And God, in all we do, may it be to bring honor and glory to you. Father, this day is your day, and we rejoice in it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And then the scripture goes on in verse 30, and it says, And then... They went to the Mount of Olives and they sang. They sang hymns. So in closing our service today, with our singer girl. Someone want to come sing? You don't want me to sing. Singer boy gone. Let's sing. Whatever.